Hi, my name is Patrick Brandley, and I'm a security trading engineer with Palo Alto Networks. Today, I want to discuss protocols and packet filtering. Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, defines how to establish and maintain a network conversation for application programs to exchange data. TCP resides on Layer 4, which is the layer charged with handling end-to-end -end communication. For protocols like TCP that send and accept packets from the network layer, numbers are assigned, and TCP is protocol number 6. TCP is connection-oriented, meaning it exists to maintain an established connection until the two ends of the conversation have finished exchanging their messages. TCP organizes application data into packets which networks can deliver, and it manages flow control, meaning TCP will ensure a receiver is not overwhelmed by a sender sending packets faster than can be consumed. It also ensures error-free data transmission by retransmitting any dropped or garbled packets and acknowledging all arriving packets. When TCP generates a conversation, it's going to do so with a source IP and a source port. Now that source port is going to be generated from a 16-bit range. It's actually 65,536 total ports, but starts with zero. So zero through 65,535. And these ports are reserved by the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, or IANA. Now it breaks up these ports into three areas. There's the well-known ports, which is 0 through 1,023. Then there's the registered ports, which is 1,024 through 49,151. Finally, there's the dynamic or private ports, that is 49,152 through 65,535. These are also known as the ephemeral ports. Different OSs will use different ranges of ephemeral ports. So, for instance, Linux will use 32,768 through 61,000. Windows, starting at around Windows Vista and Server 2008, uses 49,162 through 65,535. Now, another use of ports is with network address translation. And the Palo Alto Networks firewall, when it uses dynamic IP and port, and this is where it assigns one IP address, but can assign multiple ports to that address. So, in other words, one host will be assigned the IP address and a port, and another host will have the same IP address, but assigned a different port. And it uses 1,024 through 65,535. So that's a total of 64,512 ports, and basically uses every port except those well-known ports, that 0 through 1,023. So getting back to TCP starting a conversation, we're going to use our laptop here, and we'll say that it has an IP address of 10.1.1.100. Now this is the source IP address, right? Because we're going to be doing some kind of web surfing here and we're going to start at our laptop. Now it's going to generate a source port like we just talked about. And let's say that that source port is 49,200. Now it's going to send out to wherever its destination is. So let's say it's a web server here. And this web server is www.example.com. And that address, we'll just make up one here. We'll say that it is 90.3.4.2. So that's our destination IP address. Now, because we're going to be using uh, a web conversation here, we'll say it's HTTP, which equals port 80 on TCP. So the destination port is port 80. So in all, we have the source IP and source port going to the destination IP and destination port and it is going on TCP which is protocol number six. Now remember TCP is connection oriented so in addition to this source and destination information it's going to use to have a conversation TCP also wants to make sure that the conversation is actually going to happen. So it has a mechanism where it can confirm that both sides are sending and receiving information. So what it does is it sends what we call a TCP or three-way handshake. And that handshake is done through particular kinds of packets. To begin this handshake, the source is going to send what's called a SYN packet, which stands for synchronization, to the destination. It's also going to attach a sequence number. And since this is the beginning of the conversation, 
it'll be a zero. And it sends this over to the destination. Well, the destination is going to send an acknowledgement of this, of receiving the SYN packet with a sequence number that comes after the SYN packet sequence number, so a one. But it's also going to send its own SYN packet to the source. So we have what's called a SYN ACK. So it'll be a SYN with a zero, and then it'll be an ACK with a one. And that gets sent back. And then the source is going to acknowledge the SYN packet it received with a sequence number. So it will send its own ACK and the sequence number of one back. And that completes that handshake. Once that's been done, TCP has confirmed that both sides are talking and then it can start sending the data. And this is very similar to a handshake between human beings, right? If I walk up to you and I put my hand out and shake your hand and say, hello, how are you? And you say, I'm fine, thank you, how are you? And then we may change names, but we are now con we are now conversing. But we each know that the other is is directing his attention to the other. User Datagram Protocol or UDP uses protocol number seventeen. Now, UDP is connectionless, and this means that like TCP, it's going to use source and destination ports and source and destination IPs. But unlike TCP, it has no handshaking dialogues and it doesn't ensure reliability. So there's no guarantee of delivery, ordering, or duplication protection. But it does provide what's called checksums for data integrity. And this means it runs an algorithm to make sure nothing has changed in transit. When we say UDP is connectionless, unlike the scenario I just gave about the handshake, UDP is more like I walk by the room you're in yell something and continue on my way. I don't know that you received it, but I did send it. So in a scenario where UDP is used would be with a protocol like TFTP, or Trivial File Transfer Protocol. So let's say we have a TFTP server over here, right? And we'll say that it's at 90.3.4.2. And then we'll have our laptop here again at 10.1.100. And it's going to generate that source port again. So we'll say that's once again 49200. Now it's going to use UDP port 69 for TFTP. So now I've got a source IP of 101100, source port of 49200, destination IP of 9342, destination port 69. So when my laptop uses TFTP, it'll send a connection to the TFTP server to either push or pull some files from it, but there's nothing that's going to happen to ensure that there's any reliable transfer of this data. The other thing is, is because there's no handshake, the data can start flowing right away in that first packet. So if you were using a firewall and analyzing the traffic, you would be able to see the data or the file that's being sent almost right away. Domain Name System, or DNS, is the naming system for devices and services connected to the internet or a private network. Consider it like the network phone book, in that it translates domain names like www.example.com to numerical addresses, which we call IP addresses. So without this, then every website that we want to go to would have to be an IP address we'd have to know, and that would just be too difficult. DNS is one of the few protocols that actually uses both TCP and UDP, and it uses port 53 for both. A DNS server will maintain the domain name hierarchy, and it provides that translation services between it and the address spaces. So a DNS name server stores the DNS records for a domain, and then responds with answers to queries against its database. So if this were a DNS server here, and actually let's say we have one internally here, and we want to go to www.example.com. So we send out a query, right? We put out in our browser www.example.com. And DNS is what's going to respond with the IP address that corresponds to the name. So let's say we go to first to our internal DNS server and we send that query up and that query gets sent up 
And our DNS server says, I don't know who it is, but I will forward that query to a public DNS server. So then it goes down and up through, and then this DNS server will answer that query with the IP address. And let's say that IP address is 90.3.4.2. So now the path, the destination IP address that we require is known to the source as it sends its packets over to visit that website. Earlier I mentioned Trivial File Transfer Protocol. Well, there's another file transfer protocol, and it's actually called File Transfer Protocol, or FTP. FTP is different because it uses TCP, not UDP. And in fact, it uses more than one port. So if we have an FTP server up here, FTP will use port 21 as the server command port. And then it will use port 20 for data. So if I'm going to communicate with a FTP server, as an FTP user, I will send a connection to FTP using that handshake. And then the other side of it is I'm going to authenticate with using a username or password, or it can actually be configured to, to connect anonymously. Now it's important to remember that while this is reliable, it is not a secure transmission, so that username and password are not protected by encryption. FTP runs in either active mode or passive mode. In active mode, the client starts listening for incoming data connections from the server. And when it receives the incoming connection, it then initiates a data channel to the client from port 20. In passive mode, the client uses the control connection to send a command to the server and then receives a server IP address and server port number from the server. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP. It's the TCP protocol that we use to send and receive web pages and files on the internet. And it works by using a web browser to connect to a server, usually over TCP port 80. The server is located using what's called a Uniform Resource Locator, or URL, which is another name for a web address. This always contains HTTP colon backslash backslash at start. So if I was going to www.example.com, this is what a true URL looks like. There's a more secure version of HTTP and it's called HTTPS. And that just stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. And it uses port 443 on TCP. So if I were going to go to, say, my bank's website, and it's going to be a secure connection, then it would be HTTPS, colon, backslash, backslash, and then whatever the bank is that I'm going to, whatever its URL is, or domain name. Internet Control Message Protocol, or ICMP, is used by network devices to send error messages and operational information, indicating whether a service is available or a host or router is reachable. It uses protocol number one. Now, it's different from transport protocols such as TCP and UDP because its purpose is not to exchange data between systems, but it uses tools like ping and traceroute to test connectivity. Now, the way ping works is that it sends echo requests to a host which if it is connected to the network will reply. And ping not only checks host connectivity, but also tests bandwidth by showing how fast the echo replies are being received. So for example, I'm sitting here on my laptop and I wanna know if this server is responding and maybe my firewall and maybe my, my router. So I would send a ping to each of its IP addresses. So we'll say that, that the server here is ping, is uh, 10111. All right, and my firewall maybe is 10, 2, 1, 1, and my router might be something totally different. Uh, we'll say it's actually the other side of this connection, so 10, 2, 1, 2, okay? So I can send a ping up to here, and it's going to respond back with an echo reply, and it may send a few. And those will all show me 
Not only do I know it's there because it's actually replying, but I'm also seeing how fast it gets there because it sends me the measurement of time that it sends. And I can also send pings up to my firewall and up to my router. Now my firewall might actually be configured not to respond to pings because it's a secure device. But usually internally we can sort of have it there. Externally, a ping, say, generating from here, going back to our firewall. Our firewall may be designed not to respond so that people aren't just looking for our firewalls out on the internet. Traceroute is a tool that records the route through the hops on a network between your computer and a specified destination host. Traceroute also calculates and displays the amount of time each hop takes. So let's say I want to see how many hops it takes to get to this server up here at let's say 90.4.2.3. So I will set a traceroute and depending on what OS I'm using will depend on exactly how that command is written out, but I'll do a trace route to 90.4.2.3. So it's going to send out the trace route. And let's just say that we have a couple more routers in the process. So my trace route goes up and through my network and it goes back and then each hop sends back information about itself and the time it takes. And so I can see how many hops are in between and how long it takes to get there. So it's another way to measure my speed of my connection and the connections of others along the way. Network Time Protocol, or NTP, is a protocol for distributing the Coordinated Universal Time or UTC, by synchronizing the clocks of computer systems over IP networks. NTP is actually one of the oldest internet protocols and it's still in use. And it uses UDP port 123. So the reason we would want to use something like this is we want to have our devices synchronized. So let's say here we've got a server here, right? We've got our firewall here, our switch here, and our router here. This is in our own network. Now we want these to be synchronized because in the event of something happening, we want our logs to all be synchronized together. So we can see the event occurring on different devices and at the same time. If all of these were running their own individual clocks, you might have some variances in the, or variation in the, the timestamps. And that could make it difficult to pinpoint when something happened or to prove something happened. So if we set this up, all these devices up to talk to an NTP server. Let's just say we'll use like a public NTP server. Many universities have them and they can be used and they tend to be very accurate because they're using uh, maybe more resources than we would have available to our own private network. So we'll say this is an NTP server up here and each of these devices is configured to pull their time from, from this NTP server. So all of them synchronize with this server, so all of them carry the same UTC, UTC timestamp. And by the way, it is a good idea to use UTC because then they're all running at the same time. There's no difference in time zones. Uh, makes it a lot easier in terms of viewing the time span stamps and when things happened. When it comes to sending and receiving email, there's a couple of different protocols we use. The first one is called POP3. And it stands for Post Office Protocol, and it's the version 3. Now, it's a protocol used by email clients to get mail from a remote server over TCP IP. And it uses two ports, port 110, and this is the default POP3 non-encrypted port, or port 995, which is the encrypted version of the port. Now, email clients use POP generally uh, connect and retrieve all their messages and store them on the user's PC as new messages and delete them from the server, then disconnect. So if this was our mail server up here and I connected to it and I pulled all my email down from it, it's going to retrieve it, bring it down, store it here on my laptop and delete it from the server.